uh, on this conference. It is someone rather special, someone uh, who you would not directly expect as a speaker at a multimedia event. Uh, but I'm convinced that after this talk you would actually think differently. His talk and message are not what we conventionally see in um, this conference. It's, about, it's not about multimedia computing algorithms uh, or applications, but rather about the impact of all digital technology and data uh, around us on our society and our lives. Our speaker today is Dirk Nalpi, Professor of Computational Social Science at the ETH Zurich, Switzerland, and also an affiliate professor and recipient of the Honorary Doctor for the Delft University of Technology here in the Netherlands. He's internationally known for his work on pedestrian crowds, vehicle traffic, and agent-based models of social systems. Furthermore, he coordinates the European Union's Future ICT Initiative, which focuses on the understanding of technical, social, economic systems using smart data. His work is doc documented in hundreds of scientific uh, articles, keynotes, lectures, and media reports worldwide. Professor Helbing is an elect elected member of the German Academy of Sciences, Local Dina, and worked for the World Economic Forum's Global Agenda Council on Complex Systems. He is also co-founder of the Physics of Social Economic Systems Division of the German Physical Society and of ETH Zurich Risk Center. Managing data-rich societies wisely and reaching sustainable development are among the greatest challenges of the 21st century. Quoting Professor Helbig, we are faced with existential, tre existential threats and huge opportunities. If we don't act now, large parts of our society will not be able to economically benefit from a digital revolution. This could lead to mass unemployment and social unrest. It is time to create the right framework for digital society to come. How we can do this, we will hear from him today in his keynote entitled A Digital World to Drive In, How the Internet of Things Can Make the Invisible Handwork. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Dilkan. I've been raised at a time when most people believed that traffic jams are unavoidable, that crowd disasters are God-given or caused by panic or aggressive behavior, that stock markets are due to black swans, and that multinational companies can control and fix the world, and that social order is created by power. This is all wrong. And we really need to understand complex systems much better if you want to live in a better world. The question is, will big data solve our problems? Well, according to Chris Anderson, yes. He thought if we just had enough data, then basically we wouldn't need theory and science anymore. The data would just reveal the truth and tell us what to do. In fact, within just a minute, we are producing 700,000 Google queries, 500,000 Facebook posts, and as we go shopping, as we move around, that produces data traces. All these data together are producing big data. And of course, we can do fantastic things with this. The question is, what, what's really going on and why? Now, one of the justifications, of course, of big data or mass surveillance is uh, fighting terrorism, we know this, but in fact um, statistics says it's not very effective in that regard. So there must be other drivers of big data, and of course business is one of those drivers. Data is a new oil, one can make a lot of money with data. But maybe the most important driver is knowledge is power. And therefore, governments around the world have started to collect data as much as they could, and also many companies, and the dream was that we can now know everything. Everything that's going on in the world, in real time, in any corner, and it would be possible to create a crystal ball, and using predictive analytics, we might even see the future. Militaries around the world are working on such prediction machines. Now, would it solve our problems? Well, actually, there are some limitations of big data. The more data we have, the more patterns will be found, and among them, many spurious correlations. That means meaningless patterns. Have a look at this one. Number of serial killers as a function of chocolate consumption. 
<laughs> if that was true, you know, I would feel very unsafe in Switzerland and we would have to lock away all those chocolate lovers just to be safe. Of course, that's not a false relationship, that's why we don't have to take something over here. Now, data is also being used to classify people and objects into different categories and particularly we want to know what are good risks, what are bad risks, banks want to know that, insurance companies want to know that, secret services want to know this, but data clouds are typically overlapping and so there will be errors of first kind and of second kind and as a result there will be false alarms and alarms that don't go off, we know that very well. And we've seen that even though we saw that algorithms would be objective, now it turns out that they were actually discriminating people. They're discriminating women, they're discriminating people of color. Some of that is a result of learning, learning patterns of the past. But in any case, we don't want to have this kind of discrimination, and so we need to be much better in terms of how we produce and use algorithms and data. Now, one curious thing is that actually the 10 most livable cities in the world are not located in those big IT nations, even though they've always promised that they would now build paradise on Earth. So, the keyword is smart cities. The dream was we could now automate cities, but this technocratic dream actually turned out to be not to work so well. The citizens didn't like it much, the mayors of those cities didn't like it much, even the companies that sold those products were not happy with it because, you know, it was not a big success in this conference in Wilton Park recently actually brought all the players together in all the cities uh, that had some stakes in this and they came to the conclusion that we need to come up with a new paradigm that gets people back into the loop. Now, if the data isn't doing the job and it's solving all our problems, do we have something better than that? Would artificial intelligence, for example, fix the ball? Well, for sure, we'll have intelligent machines and in about 20 years people expect to have machines that are actually more intelligent than people. Some people say it will be 40 years or 100 years, some people think it might even be in 5 years time or maybe we are there already. In any case, um, I think intelligent machines will be useful tools for us and as they get smarter, they will be like teammates. In fact, there are some boards of companies which are already using AI systems. So it's like a colleague in a sense. And then the next step would be, they would be our coaches that correct our mistakes. And the question is, would they be our bosses? And these are the kind of questions that uh, people at MIT and elsewhere are already working on. Now, if we extrapolate that further, suppose now we, we had big data, Internet of Things, quantum computing, all of that together, and we would take a hundred billion dollars. Now, what could we build? We could we build a machine that optimizes the world? Could the world be run by a benevolent dictator? Or by a biased king? That's the kind of question that visionary people ask. And in fact, Facebook seems to have imperial ambitions. So, they'd like to run the world. IBM would like to do that. They propose IBM Watson, the cognitive computer for a president, actually. And Google wants to reprogram the state. That means we're talking about times where companies are building operation systems for society, not operating systems for computers and for smartphones, operating systems for society that would operate everyone 
That means we would be programmed. And the question is, is that a good or a bad thing? Could society be run like a giant machine? If you wanted to do this, then basically you would need to know what are all these pieces and how do they behave? And how can they be manipulated and controlled? And this has been worked on actually for quite some time. Cybernetic societies have been around since the 70s of last century. Chile was uh, the first one. It was considered to be the third model besides capitalism and communism. And the United States got nervous about it because it worked quite well. The CIA took the system down on September 11, 1973, and then they committed suicide. But the ideas lived on, and it's still around, for example, in Singapore, which considers itself a social laboratory. The question now, what are you talking about? But anyway, after the automation of production and of cars, it seems like the automation of society is next. But there are two ways of automating society. One would be trying to control it in a top-down way or allowing it to self-organize and self-govern. Now, let's stay with the first subject first. How does it work? Well, it's using actually machine learning algorithms such as deep learning and that's running on big data of the entire world. Actually, personal data, your data, your data that has been collected most of the time secretly without your agreement, but it's still around. This data is being fed into machine learning algorithms to find out what you're doing and how you can be manipulated. In fact, Google was one of the first companies to find out how people could be manipulated with personalized information. So they made millions of experiments to find out how you can be made to click certain links to buy certain products. And now we have, of course, recommender systems that recommend you everything from holiday destinations to conferences, to flights, to hotels, uh, to partners. And all of this is being steered by computers today. And as it's personalized to you, you would not even notice that you're being manipulated. It feels like your own decision, but it's not. And of course, that is interesting also for politics, where we talk about nudging. Well, many people thought nudging would be a great thing, but nobody admitted that would be combined with big data with our personal data that shouldn't exist to manipulate and control us. And that's what's going on, that's what we call big nudging. And in fact, the science behind it was uh, started off by Skinner, who put animals into boxes and exposed them actually to rewards and punishments, such as electrical shocks, and made them do or not do certain kind of things. And it's been called conditioning behavior. Now, this is now being applied to humans. We are being conditioned. Also with personalized prices, by the way. And the Skinner box is actually the information bubble that's being built around us. We don't feel it, but it's guiding our attention, it's influencing our emotions, our opinions, our decisions, and our behavior. So we're basically turned into puppets that can be steered remotely, that can, can be controlled to some extent. <clears throat> now suppose one could do that, then basically the strategy would be to control the world as if it would be a grand chessboard. I recommend you to read this book, you will understand history much better after that. Now, if the world was a grand chessboard, and we were the pieces, then, well, basically, you'd think it takes a big chess computer. Since a couple of decades, of course, computers are much better chess players than even the smartest chess players. And so, 
you would want to build with the most powerful chess computer to control the world. And in fact, there have been projects around of this kind, and uh, one of them is called Sentient World. It basically produces a digital double of yourself and feeds in all the personal data. So, you know, there is a copy of yourself somehow in the virtual space, and that's being used to find out how the world might evolve, but moreover, also to find out how you would be manipulated. So the question comes up, is democracy an outdated technology? Some people have claimed that it has produced actually wealth, health and happiness for billions of people, but now is the time to do something new. Why? But anyway, this is happening. You know, democracies worldwide are under pressure, like in Turkey, in Hungary, in Poland, in France, and I'd like to say stop. I don't think this is a good development. It's very dangerous for the world, because we might lose everything we built over hundreds of years. Freedom and self-determination, human dignity, assumed innocence, fairness, justice, the right to pursue your own happiness, pluralism, democracy, participation, all of that are endangered. And I recommend you to read a number of books about these kind of things. Some of them are in German, the program Human, The Formula to Rule the World, The End of Democracy, The Smart Dictatorship, um, and there is now a new book by Kasatsky, and actually he was one of the fathers of nudging. And apparently he's getting concerned about the way it's being used. So have a look at it. The question, how big is this problem? Now recently, after the publication of our additional manifesto in Spectrum der Wissenschaft, there has been a discussion setting in, and uh, people are asking, is Facebook, for example, manipulating our thinking? Is it making ourselves more extremist, radical? Yeah. Is it damaging society? There's a discussion about the power of misinformation, and in fact, this is part of today's hybrid war that is going on every day. It turns out that uh, AI is not only being used to come up with objective, unbiased, unemotional decisions, but in fact, uh, it's uh, profitable actually to lie at us, to manipulate us. And that has created a situation that people are now calling a fact-free world. It's becoming increasingly difficult actually to distinguish facts from lies. And we're really strongly manipulated by these technologies. So social bots are influencing our opinion formation and only endangering the internet. I would say they're endangering our society. And a good example for this is actually the Brexit vote. Because it turns out that social bots had a say in this vote. They strongly influence people towards Brexit. And that, of course, has had a major political impact. It's broken Europe apart into pieces. Many people regret, actually, the decisions that they made. They were wondering, now, what have they done? Um, and the markets broke down. Three trillions lost in just one day. Now, guess who pays for this? Of course, we, the people. Now, I'm not the only one who's critical. You know, Martin Schulz, who's the president of the European Parliament, actually said, we now need to fight against technological totalitarianism. And nobody was listening, because nobody understood what he was talking about, actually. Pope Francis was saying, now, what's up with you, humanistic Europe, the defender of human rights, democracy, and freedom. And also, Barack Obama has been warning the world. 
by saying that this is also a time around the world when some of the fundamental ideals of liberal democracies are under attack and when notions of objectivity and of the free press and of facts and of evidence are trying to be undermined or in some cases ignored entirely. So what's going on in the world when the three most powerful people that we know of can't do anything about something that they are very worried about. Well, some years ago, when I was in Brussels at the conference, there was a woman in a red dress uh, who proposed a project called Matrix Reloaded. I believe this Matrix has actually been built behind our backs. I believe it's being run from CERN, and I am not the only one who has these kind of concerns. Elon Musk and others have reasonably suggested we might live in a computer simulation, and I believe he is talking exactly about the same thing, about this matrix that has been created to control our thinking and our behavior, and that's why actually Tech billionaires are now spending large amounts of money. Elon Musk has, for example, established Open AI for one billion dollars, spending large amounts of money to solve this problem. Even in the past days, the, the biggest IT companies such as Google, Amazon, Facebook, IBM, Microsoft have decided to make an effort together to solve the ethical problems and kind of break the filter bubbles that have been created around us. So if such an exceptional thing happens, then obviously we're confronted with a real big problem. But I think we can break ourselves free in a different way, actually. You know, we just need to take control of the data we need to run our society. We need to understand that our society is actually a complex system and doesn't work in the way that some people have thought it would work. And the reason is actually digitization. So, in fact, computer power is increasing exponentially. According to Moore's law, it's doubling about every 18 months. I would think, you know, it's just a matter of time until we can really optimize the world with computer power. Well, here's one thing, by the way. Um, if you want to optimize the world, you need to know what ball fun function you need to choose. Right? Today's AI systems have no explicit goal functions. And even if we could set the goal function, we don't know what should it be. Should it GDP per capita, or should it be sustainability? Should it be power or peace? Should it be life expectancy or happiness? Or what should it be? There's no science to advise you. Even with the biggest quantum computers, you couldn't solve that problem. And that's why we have pluralism and diversity, because that hedges risks against unexpected developments. But anyway, so processing power is increasing. The data volume is increasing in faster. The green curve shows you this. It's doubling every 12 months. That means within just one year, we produce as much data as in the entire history of humankind. This is amazing. It's hardly imaginable. And so the percentage of data we can process is going down over time. That means we need to know what data to process and how. And that's what science is for, for science is that. Now, even though we have the best technology ever, and more data than ever, it turns out that we are losing control over this world. If you look, open the newspapers, you know, you can clearly see this. And the question is, why is this happening? And the reason is because we are networking the world that creates combinatorial complexity. And the combinatorial function increases even faster than the exponential one. So it overtakes, and that's why we lose top-down control. We need a new control paradigm, which is distributed control, and that leads us actually to, towards the need to 
have those complex systems self organize and self regulate. Now, in, in a largely network system, whatever force you apply will have not only the intended effects, it will have side effects, it will have feedback effects, it will have cascade effects. And this is why we need to control complex systems in a different way. Society cannot be steered like a car because there are all those interactions and those interactions produce unexpected and in some cases undesirable outcomes. Here all drivers actually have the information they need to drive in a circle without stopping, right? It doesn't need to be a difficult task. They have a good education, have a driver's license, good technology, they have the intention to avoid the traffic jam, but it nevertheless happens. Even if we could read the mind of all those drivers now, we couldn't prevent it. We could see the traffic jam happen, but that's it. Now actually there's a mathematics that allows us to understand this. It turns out the reason for this is systemic instability, and I will explain to you later on what we can do about this. There are actually many problems in the world that are due to systemic instability. Crowd disasters is another one. So when densities get too high, then things get out of control. People might die even though nobody may want to kill anybody. Here is an example. A crowd disaster during the Hajj in 2015. In fact, they had 5,000 CCTV cameras and mass surveillance. That didn't help. And they had the company actually optimize the system, but they optimized travel time or comfort. Before, in the years before, the system had been optimized for other things, for safety in particular, right? So optimization mass surveillance doesn't guarantee you the outcomes that you want to have. Things are much more sophisticated, and you know that's, this is a lesson actually if for those who want to optimize the world. And in many cases, things get totally out of control because of these amplification and cascade effects. And while this is an entertaining experiment that you can do on a rainy weekend. Actually, such kind of things are happening in reality, as we've seen actually during the world financial crisis. After Lehman Brothers went bankrupt, actually hundreds of banks went bust and cost, cost of hundreds of billions of dollars. And in fact, cascade effects can undermine the very basis of our societies. We have seen that actually after September 11, the United States is certainly the country that had the most power in the world, but it didn't help. The wars in Afghanistan and Iraq didn't come out as expected. Rather, tension was spreading internationally, and now we see it in many countries, and so this is creating a situation that brings us to the cusp of World War III. The world has never been in such a great danger as today. So we really need to wake up, we need a new paradigm, we need to go from power to empowerment, from a top-down control culture to a culture of bottom-up self-organization. That means to go away from that over-regulation as we have it today, today towards designing systems in such a way that they would support the self-organization of people. And here is actually um, a nice example. Oh, that movie doesn't run for some reason, so I'm skipping it. But it would have demonstrated that it's really a matter of some design details that determine whether a system self-organizes well or not. The idea is quite old, 300 years old at least. The Fable of Bees has formulated that. <coughs> In fact, we know that from social insects such as bees and ants, that they organize quite beautifully, even those that even though bees and ants don't have much intelligence, right? It 
It must be the interactions between those P's and I's that produces these beautiful outcomes, a beautiful order. Or look at these birds flocks that are really amazing, so everyone loves to see them. How are they doing this? Just imagine now, you would have, say, 10,000 planes <laughs> they would have to coordinate in such a way that for sure they would fail. So how are birds doing this? Uh, they don't have a big computer. Yeah. Now the interesting thing is we can now run the world in such a way because now we have the Internet of Things and with the Internet of Things we can make the self organization with the invisible hand work that was formulated by Adam Smith and so the issue is really how to let complex systems self organize Now complex systems are made up of many parts that interact with each other, that adapt to each other, and that makes it so difficult to understand the systems and to predict them and to control them, but they have one feature, they tend to self-organize. And as a result, you get self-organized structures, properties and functions, and those depend on the kind of interactions. If you change the interactions, you might get a different structure or a different function. So, if we want to have a certain structure or function evolve or result, by self-organization, you just need to find the right kind of interactions and the system will do it for you, like magic, very efficiently. And in fact, here is an example, right? Um, we're simulating here traffic flow as we have it today to demonstrate you that we understand the process. The annoying stuff will go with traffic as I showed you before. Well, there are mathematical equations that's private and that can be run with computer. And once we have seen that, we get annoyed, of course, and that's why we want to get on the car, and that's what we're doing. So we're elevating ourselves now in order to see what is actually the reason for this damn traffic jam. And it turns out it's this on-ramp. Cars are trying to get on the free that, that produces small disruptions. Those are being amplified and eventually that, that produces stop go waves. Now, assume we equip, say, 40% of cars with these radar sensors that measure the distances and relative velocities. And that those cars drive automatically in a slightly different way from humans. And that can be actually done in such a way that the traffic flow will be stabilized and the traffic flow will be slightly increased. So we get rid of the traffic jam even though the inflow stays the same. This is amazing. We don't even need a traffic control center here. We just need to change the interaction of some fraction of the cars. So the success principle for gaining control or getting the outcomes that you want in complex systems is real-time data, real-time feedback to create those interactions that you'd like to have to create a certain outcome by self-organization. And that principle can be applied actually in multiple levels. Now, you can apply this, of course, in a company, can apply that in cities, in societies, in the entire world, the principle. The difference with the system before, the top-down control, is that this leaves you freedoms for creativity and innovation, for enfolding your own personality and talents. So it's not saying you do what you do this, but it's saying we need three people to do this. Who would do that? And for this, we need an incentive system. So it's a completely different approach. It's a market approach that, uh, of course, would be much better than the command economy that such a top-down system as discussed before would imply. In fact, it's working beautifully. So we've been looking actually at the efficiency of traffic light control, classically of traffic control centers that try to optimize traffic flow and can't do that in real time because it's too complex to be solved in real time. Now we have taken a completely different route here. We have gone for local, flexible adaptation 
to the real traffic flow, to the real need locally. That means the traffic flows control the traffic lights rather than the other way around, and that creates a situation actually where there are benefits for all traffic participants and for the environment as well. Uh, it works beautifully. It's more efficient than the classical top-down control approach. And actually, such decentralized approaches are becoming also more popular in the electrical power grids. Here were the smart grids. It's also becoming interesting for industry 4.0, where basically the products can now tell the machines what should be done in this town. And the products could all tell, talk to other products and tell them, well, actually, let me overtake I'm in a hurry. I need to be delivered soon. So here's a completely new approach. And that approach of self organization can also be applied to society. In fact, we know that self organization can be quite efficient in pedestrian flows if the density isn't too high. Uh, as we have also already shown you, that we can understand traffic flow as a as phenomenon, that we can guide the self organization in such a way that we get favorable outcomes. Opinion information is a self organized process, coordination, cooperation. Unfortunately, crime too. So, as I indicated before, self organization doesn't necessarily produce desirable outcomes, but changing interactions would change the outcome. So, this is what we can learn with science, such as social physics, computational, social science, evolutionary, game theory, and all these kind of things are actually giving answers to us um, how society works in a self organized way and how we can use these success principles actually also in social technical systems that we have built. You know, how to design social media platforms, for example. Right? There's a lot of complaint about Facebook and Twitter and uh, all the hate speech that uh, seems to trigger, but this is because those social mechanisms that would create social order and cooperation haven't been implemented over there. In fact, since Nobel Prize winner Elinor Ostrom, we know that self governments can be efficient when we have proper design principles. And societies, since the very beginning, have been confronted with cooperation problems, social dilemmas, as people often say, such as the public goods problem, free riding, yeah, or stack kind of game. So these are well-known cooperation problems and interestingly enough, there are decentralized approaches to build cooperation through self-organization. And one of them, or this mechanism, is direct reciprocity. So it's again about interaction. So I help you, you help me. Peer punishment is another mechanism. Um, signaling, costly signaling. Uh, can be quite efficient. Um, and actually, merit based matching that means if those people interact uh, who are more cooperative, then that creates incentives to cooperate because they would be more successful. And there are actually many more mechanisms that we can use to support cooperation in a self organized way. We can build them into those platforms. And we should be doing this. So I see an era of social inspired technologies coming where we use these insights to trigger self organized cooperation, self regulation, conflict resolution, resilience, trust, reputation, social norms, values, values by design. That is really a very important keyword these days. And this would be promoted by digital assistants. Of course, we all know these route guiding systems. The important point here is they are not trying to manipulate us, I hope, uh, but you're in control. You can turn them on and off. You are setting the goal. And once you've done that, uh, it's uh, giving you options, like it's asking you, do you want to minimize travel, uh, travel time or distance or greenhouse gases, and you can choose. And once you've chosen, it would help you to achieve your goal 
in the optimal way. And this kind of approach, of digital assistants that may use AI, of course, to work on your behalf and help you, that can be applied to many different problems, you know, like disasters, for example. They could warn us of disasters, like collective earthquake sensing and warning. It could help us actually to map crisis in a crowdsourced way. It could help us to help each other in case of this disaster. So we can build all sorts of apps for this, like a sharing economy app, for example, that would sit on our smartphone and would help each other in case of need. In case of disaster also, maybe the communication network would be down, so we would want to run on our smartphones uh, through an ad hoc network or a mesh net. We'd want to be able to pay when electricity and the normal communication network wouldn't work. Also, that could be built into our smartphones. Right? It could be a peer-to-peer -peer payment system. And uh, yeah, our smartphones could be really a assistance for all sorts of situations that support our situational awareness and support the success of our interactions with others. And very nice example is, of course, real-time translation that helps us to overcome cultural barriers. But you couldn't imagine that uh, in perspective we would have much more sophisticated assistance that would be like guides that help us to understand other cultures and other people and all this. In fact, every culture is made up of thousands of success principles and most of them we can't even mention explicitly. Uh, we could work them out, we could operationalize them and we could learn how to combine these success principles in novel ways to solve the problems that we confronted with. There are many of them. In fact, I believe we'll see a major transformation of our society. Probably the biggest transformation we've seen since a hundred years, if not thousands of years. And if you're interested uh, in my thoughts about it, uh, I recommend you to read this paper, Why We Need Democracy 2.0 and Capitalism 2.0 to Survive. Now, I think this will be actually a triple transformation. First of all, the digital transformation. AI will take away many of the jobs of today. And that will set free capacity actually to pay attention to social and ecological issues. And in fact, within just 15 years, approximately, we'll also have to reshape the entire economy towards a low carbon economy. So half of our economy, I believe, will have to be reinvented. The digital revolution hopefully will allow us to do this. And the third transformation is actually the financial transformation. So giving you a little bit more justification for why I think these three transformations will happen and how they're interlinked with each other. Um, yeah, so I already indicated AI is taking away quite a bit of jobs. I'll skip this video. Well, you're now in the middle of really a fundamental transformation as we've seen it when the agricultural society turned into an industrial society and later from there into a service society. We're now seeing a transformation into a digital society. Now the problem is that these transformations were never smooth. They came with financial and economic crisis and also with revolutions and wars, unfortunately. So we already have a financial and economic crisis in those countries. So the question is, can we avert revolutions and wars? And I hope so. I hope we have learned from history. So, yes, about 50% of today's jobs will be gone in a couple of years. This is already happening in many countries. So, in many European countries, young people have an unemployment rate of more than 50%. This is, of course, endangering social peace, but it's not only a challenge for employees, but also for companies. Because within just 10 years, 40% of today's top 500 companies will be gone. And in fact, now the leaders of the world, such as Barack Obama, have understood there is an issue. We must remake society in the coming age of AI. And 
AI will impact jobs. This is what has now been understood. So society needs to be reinvented. The ecological transformation. Well, in fact, we haven't solved our existential threats. There's climate change, there's this financial, economic, and spending crisis. Uh, peace is becoming more and more unstable, it seems. There's mass migration, there's terrorism, and all of this happens for one reason, I believe, which is lack of sustainability. We are overusing resources, and as we are overusing resources, they're lacking elsewhere, and there it creates conflict and war, and that causes mass migration and terrorism. So, if we want a better future, if we want the world to improve, we need to solve this problem that we are overusing resources. I will tell you how to do that. And finally, the financial transformation. So, we need to be aware the financial system is a system that decides if there are limited resources, who gets how much of what? So it's a coordination system, mainly. And you can imagine there could be thousands or even millions of coordination systems that could be used instead. Most likely hundreds of better systems. In fact, at the moment we have a situation where some people suffer from obesity and others suffer from hunger. So it doesn't come together, right? in detail. It just comes together on average and we're wasting a lot of resources. So there's enough of resources for everyone in fact. Now, besides this, our current monetary system has often undermined environmental and social goals. But not only this, now it's even not anymore working economically. It's not neither working for the people lack of buying power, nor for the banks apparently, nor for businesses that don't find the money to, to come up with new uh, business models and new products and services, nor for the states, which are more or less bankrupt. Yeah? If the interest rate would raise only by half a percent, a lot of countries would be bankrupt immediately. And uh, part of this is because the inequality has reached a level that is actually holding back economic growth. As OECD, World Economic Forum, IMF and so on are saying. And part of this is related to the fiat currency system that we have today, where we can kind of limit this, produce new money, more money than there are resources on this world. And in fact, it has tempted us to spend uh, more money on, on resources than we should have. In fact, well, we now have the highest debt levels in those countries that have fiat currency systems, um, United States, Europe, Japan, for example, and so we're suffering from that system. It doesn't work for us well any longer. And part of this is also related to the fact that the central banks that control this are privately owned, in part. And that creates a situation where private people earn more money if governments have to make debt. So that's one of the reasons why governments are making so much debts, I guess. And this is creating a conflict of interest. I'm not worried about some people being super rich. I'm worried about the fact that we have a financial system that doesn't work well for the world. And that needs to be changed. And you can change this. We need to get from a system which creates a downward spiral, makes things worse and worse and worse, drives us close to a third world war. We need to turn that into an upward spiral. And that's why we need to build this finance for the old system that could be an efficient, liberal, participatory, social, democratic, and ecological system and the goal must be actually to create finally a circular economy because if we are running into resource shortages in future the only way out is to reuse resources again and again and again in effect if we do that also using new possibilities of sharing economies then we can create a high level of uh, a high quality of life for more people with less resources
just need to get away from the supply chain model, repeat in new resources, produce products, and then throw them away in the end. So recycling, of course, would fix the issue. And we are trying to work on this to demonstrate the idea, the principle. NervousNet is the project that I'm talking about. It's an open source project. Um, and it's using smartphones and other Internet of Things sensors in order to make measurements. And in fact, uh, it would allow us to jointly create our own global measurement system. A system that we can trust because it would be controlled by you. You determine what sensors are being opened and whether the data will be used just for yourself, for smart home applications, or it would be shared. And that system would be run as a citizen web. You know, so this, this would be the way to free ourselves from the matrix. But we can do much more than that. You know, we can now basically measure what economists call externality.